We're here for the second chapter of The Great Gatsby. Looking backward, last week we covered chapter one, which contained a party, an intimate party, dinner party. It was set in the spring of 1922, gave us our time and our location. We were in East Egg and West Egg, and we talked about the difference between old money and new money. And we spent the time at the Buchanan household. The main characters involved were Nick, Tom, Daisy, Jordan, and Gatsby himself, who was silent. We made the allusions to Midas, Morgan, and Mycenas, and we looked at the vocabulary of privy, feigned, supercilious, and riotous. Coming into chapter two, we're going to experience another party. In this chapter, we will have the movement from the eggs to Manhattan, and we will see what happens with Tom and Myrtle. And I'm going to try to control our reception of Myrtle. About halfway between West Egg and New York, the motor road hastily joins the railroad and runs beside it for a quarter of a mile so as to shrink away from a certain desolate area of land. This is a valley of ashes, a fantastic farm where ashes grow like wheat onto ridges and hills and grotesque gardens where ashes take the forms of houses and chimneys and rising smoke. And finally, with a transcendent effort of men who move dimly and already crumbling through the powdery air. Occasionally, a line of gray cars crawls along an invisible track, gives out a ghastly creak and comes to rest. And immediately, the ash gray men swarm up with leaden spades and stir up an impenetrable cloud. Here are a couple of images to have in mind as we talk through this passage. You'll see basically what these ash heaps are, are large heaps of garbage. This is where the, the garbage disposal of Manhattan is. Let's return to this passage. Notice halfway. This time when you're in between spaces is called a liminal space. That is a space that's partway between two others. We've mentioned this maybe once or twice. We have this idea of two different types of transportation with the motor road and the railroad. And uh, then we have a really great word, desolate. Desolate means isolated, but also abandoned and a lack of people. In the second paragraph here that I have composed, we have a really great use of the indefinite article A. That implies there's other valleys of ashes. This is just one of them. And then Fitzgerald gives us some alliteration with a fantastic farm and then later grotesque gardens. He's setting up this area where we have ashes which are growing. What we have here is a paradox. Ashes, of course, are the remnant of something after death, right? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But of course, ash also goes into the earth and can act as a fertilizer. So fantastic farms and grotesque gardens create a version of nature which is extremely perverse. And then the ashes do something even odder. They go from being wheat into ridges and hills, so natural formations, and from ridges and hills, they become houses and chimneys. We move from the natural world into the world of civilization, but all of it is being sustained and built out of ashes. And we ultimately move toward the idea of transcendence, which go, means to go beyond, and at that point, we have men appear, but the men live in a world that's already crumbling, that's already destroyed, that's already, one might even say, eschatological. And then in the third paragraph here, we have this lovely phrase of a line of gray cars crawls along the invisible track and gives out a ghastly, meaning um, having close to do with death and ghosts even, um, it's a pale face, creak and comes to a rest. 
And notice we have we go from the powdery air to the impenetrable cloud. Impenetrable means you can't penetrate it, so you can't see through this. This is one of our first instances of the idea of blindness, which will permeate this chapter. Immediately after this, we have the billboard of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. This is also why I began this slide with the very famous image of LeBron James in Cleveland, getting us thinking about perhaps connections between Gatsby and Cleveland itself. But above the gray land and the spasms of bleak dust which drift endlessly over it, you perceive after a moment the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. The eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg are blue and gigantic. Their retinas are one yard high. They look out of no face, but instead from a pair of enormous yellow spectacles which pass over a non-existent nose. Evidently, some wild wag of a cultist set them there to fatten his practice in the burrows of queens and then sank down himself into eternal blindness or forgot them and moved away. But his eyes, dimmed a little by many paintless days under sun and rain, brewed on over the solemn dumping ground. Very famous book. This is a very famous passage. I don't want to dwell too long on it other than just to point it out. People will argue that these can be the eyes of God. Um, I tend to associate it more closely with this theme of forgetfulness, what it means to do something large and not really care for it afterward. Right? This is about lost lives of men, of people. If you ever need a title for a book that you want to write, I highly recommend Many Paintless Days. It's a very, very beautiful phrase. However, one of the things that I do want to draw attention to are this idea of repetition, the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg, the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. This is a literary technique. It's called anadiplosis. Anadiplosis. And what this is, is a form of emphatic repetition. We are meant to focus in on these eyes and see them, and they become large. They're blue and gigantic. The retinas are one yard high. However, they're faceless and noseless. All we have are the giant spectacles. So there's this theme of sight, and yet we go from sight into blindness, picking up this second theme of blindness. Tom has picked up Nick in order to go into the city, and on the way there, they pick up his mistress, Myrtle Wilson. And the first week glimpse that we get of Myrtle is through the eyes of Nick. So this is, of course, the male gaze. Then I heard footsteps on a stairs, and in a moment, the thickish figure of a woman blocked out the light from the office door. She was in the middle 30s and faintly stout, but she carried her surplus flesh sensuously as some women can. Her face above a spotted dress of dark blue crepe de chine, contained no facet or gleam of beauty, but there was an immediate perceptible vitality about her as if the nerves of her body were continually smoldering. She smiled slowly and walking through her husband as if he were a ghost, shook hands with Tom, looking him flush in the eye. Then she wet her lips, and without turning around, spoke to her husband in a soft, coarse voice. This is a tour de force paragraph of the male gaze and implicit misogyny. And it's our first glimpse of a character that we'll spend a fair amount of time with, especially in this chapter. The first impression that we have of her is all about the body. There's no appreciation for it from Nick's point of view, not the way, say, that he admired the slim, small breasted nature of Jordan, but instead what he's interested in are these kind of two concepts, vitality and the sensuous. Vitality means full of life, vita. Sensuously means engaging the senses. It has to do with slow movement. And Fitzgerald draws attention to this with surplus flesh sensuously his language is mimicking the movement of the body in a really interesting way as you go through it. Read it out loud. And then later on, we get the vitality. And finally, she's smoldering. She smiled slowly, using alliteration to give us this movement. 
Smoldering means burning, like the embers of a fire. And then finally, we hear her soft, coarse voice. We've already had one woman whose voice was emphasized, but that was the shimmering, hypnotic voice of Daisy. And so Fitzgerald is carefully setting up these two figures to compare. And of course, they're also connected because of how Tom is going to treat the two of them. Something to pay attention to with Myrtle is the way that she treats men, right? She treats her husband as though he's a ghost versus Tom, who's solid and substantial. Before we move on to the party, I want to make a quick sartorial reading about Myrtle. Because at the party, she's going to change for a third time. And we're going to have the line, with the influence of the dress, her personality had undergone a change. Fitzgerald's asking us to think about the language of clothing and personality. Right? This is exactly what a lot of you just finished writing a paper about. The first time we see her, she was wearing, quote, a spotted dress of dark blue crepe de chine. Crepe de chine looks like fake silk. So there's this sense of imitation that we have at this onset. To travel, she had changed her dress to a brown figured muslin. Muslin is just a plain woven fabric, right? So there's nothing that stands out as she's traveling and being inconspicuous. However, once they come to the apartment and throw this party, she transforms herself into an elaborate afternoon dress of chiffon. And chiffon is actually a silk and it's often transparent. So she's gone from being inconspicuous here with the muslin to now an element of transparency and she moved out of the fakeness. So there's these three levels of myrtle that we have and she expresses them all through clothing. The second party begins with Nick's declaration that, quote, I have been drunk just twice in my life, and the second time was that afternoon. So everything that happened has a dim, hazy cast over it. Although until after eight o'clock, the apartment was full of the cheerful sun. What's Nick doing? Why is he making this point about deliberately saying, I was drunk and I don't remember it? Well, what this is going to allow him is a certain plausible deniability over the rest of the chapter. He can say, hey, didn't happen, or I'm not sure what happened, or I wasn't involved because I was drunk and it has a dim, hazy cast. This continues our theme of blindness. Only here, it seems to be deliberate blindness because Nick does not want to be a participant. One of the most intriguing figures at this party is the artist Chester McKee. Mr. McKee was a pale, feminine man from the flat below. He had just shaved, for there was a white spot of lather on his cheekbone, and he was most respectful in his greeting to everyone in the room. He informed me that he was in the artistic game, and I gathered later that he was a photographer and had made the dim enlargement of Mrs. Wilson's mother, which hovered like an ectoplasm on the wall. His wife was shrill, languid, handsome, and horrible. She told me with pride that her husband had photographed her 127 times since they had been married. And then later on, once the party's well underway, Nick looks at his watch and found it was 10. Mr. McKee was asleep on a chair with his fists clenched in his lap like a, the photograph of a man of action. Taking out my handkerchief, I wiped from his cheek the remains of a spot of dried lather that had worried me all afternoon. Notice what we start with, a pale feminine man. This is a form of androgyny. Androgyny is a, when you, it's made up literally of uh, Greek word andros, meaning man, and gune, meaning woman. And it's a type of inability to have strong masculine or feminine characteristics. So Tom is a one spectrum of masculinity. Daisy is one spectrum of femininity. Jordan and Mr. McKee inhabit a middle space. Myrtle is also an example of extreme femininity. This is the kind of person that Nick finds himself drawn to in a certain way. Notice um, that he is an artist similar to Nick is himself a writer and the, we have the ghost almost of Mrs. Wilson's mother because it's hovering like an ectoplasm which is like a spiritual remnant. It's what the Ghostbusters go and kick out. And Nick immediately does not like his wife who he finds shrill which has to do with a critique of the voice languid, a slowness of the body, and then the alliterative, handsome and horrible, which don't actually go together, right? 
Portable is a personality trait versus handsome is a physical trait. And then later on, he has this very intimate detail of wiping from his cheek the spot of lather that's worried him all afternoon. Nick has been focused on this man's body all day looking at his face. An important passage comes later on, and it has to do with the gossip about Tom and Myrtle. Catherine leaned close to me and whispered in my ear, neither of them can stand the person they're married to. Can't they? Can't stand them. She looked at Myrtle and then at Tom. What I say is, why go on living with them if they can't stand them? If I was them, I'd get a divorce and get married to each other right away. Doesn't she like Wilson either? The answer to this was unexpected. It came from Myrtle, who had overheard the question, and it was violent and obscene. You see, cried Catherine triumphantly. She lowered her voice again. It's really his wife that's keeping them apart. She's a Catholic, and they don't believe in divorce. Daisy was not a Catholic, and I was a little shocked at the elaborateness of the lie. The passage is stunning. The passage compares in a very striking way with the exchange of gossip between Jordan and Nick in chapter one about the awareness of there being a mistress. Catherine here is complicit in an elaborate lie. She's aware that this is an affair and yet she's still going on with it. However, we learn something quite striking about Tom's approach to this because what is Tom doing? Tom is saying that his wife is Catholic and doesn't believe in divorce. So clearly, Tom does not want to marry Myrtle. Tom just wants to be with Myrtle for one reason. Maybe more than one reason. I'll let you speculate about that. One of the things that I want to emphasize is how Catherine seems to see a romance in this exchange. She finds them to be star-crossed lovers, almost, who can't be together because of his wife. And this introduces an early theme of blaming women, of female blame. Notice people do not like to take responsibility for their actions in this novel. The whole situation culminates in an act of extreme violence. So we already had Myrtle's violent and obscene outburst, which was vocal, and this is followed by a violent and obscene outburst of Tom's, which is physical. Sometime toward midnight, Tom Buchanan and Mrs. Wilson stood face to face, discussing in impassioned voices whether Mrs. Wilson had any right to mention Daisy's name. So you'll remember the first time that we saw Myrtle and Tom, she looked him eye to eye, and now here they are for the second time in this chapter, face to face. Daisy, 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 shouted Mrs. Wilson. I'll say it whenever I want to. Daisy, Daisy. Making a short, deft movement, Tom Buchanan broke her nose with his open hand. Then there were bloody towels upon the bathroom floor, and women's voices scolding, and high over the confusion, a long broken wail of pain. Notice this word deft. Deft means skilled. It's not clumsy. This is part of the athleticism of Tom, and the athleticism of Tom is deployed to cause violence to a woman's body, right? He is abusive, and his response to conflict is to enact physical violence. There's finally, the last, chap last lines of this book have a very provocative ellipsis. Then Mr. McKee turned and continued on and out the door. Taking my hat from the chandelier, I followed. Come to lunch someday, he suggested as we groaned down in the elevator. Where? Anywhere. Keep your hands off the lever, snapped the elevator boy. I beg your pardon, said Mr. McKee with dignity. I didn't know I was touching it. All right, I agreed. I'll be glad to. Ellipsis. I was standing beside his bed and he was sitting up between the sheets, clad in his underwear with a great portfolio in his hands. Beauty and the Beast, Loneliness, Old Grocery Horse, Brook and Bridge. Then I was lying half asleep in the cold lower level of the Pennsylvania station, staring at the morning Tribune and waiting for the four o'clock train. So a provocative, fun, exciting question is, what happens in the space between that ellipsis, right? You'll remember an ellipsis indicates a gap. So what's lost? Why might Nick have been interested in telling us about being drunk, getting that plausible deniability? And what evidence can you use 
to support your argument for what you think happens in that space. What words are important? What I want you to think about before we do chapter three on Thursday, kind of four questions, and I'd like you to pick one of these and post about it on the forum. Number one, so far in these two first two chapters, what is the role of gossip? Number two, what do you find Nick's major interests are when it comes to narrating the events around him? Number three, how does Nick try to avoid responsibility and make himself sound as passive as possible? And number four, and this is kind of the most difficult and requires you to have read pretty closely. How does the apartment in the party resemble the Valley of Ashes? Why might the novel be making this connection? Words and phrases you might think about here are blind and smoke, and also the movement of men. Uh, enjoy. I hope you got a lot out of this. I certainly am enjoying making these movies, although I desperately miss being in class to find other connections that you all see. Otherwise, I will see you on Thursday with chapter three.